Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As always, we have a great event on tap, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later on. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for our speaker, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question. And we'll try to get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. Also happening at the end of today's webinar, we will be doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our four lucky winners. All right, with that, let's go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is how to build a healthy on-call culture. Our speaker today is Sirhat Khan, who is a technical evangelist at Atlassian. Sirhat, thank you so much for joining me today. Pleasure to have you here. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. All right. Well, I know you've got a great event, a great presentation on tap. I'm going to take myself off camera, put myself on mute, and let you get right to it. All right. Thank you. So we just had a great AWS Reinvent keynote. So I was just watching that. It was exciting. And now uh, I'm really happy to be with you today. So I'm going to talk about on-call. But first, let me talk a little bit about myself. Um, so my name is Sarhat Jan, and uh, I work for Atlassian, specifically for the Ops Genie team. So I've been working with the Ops Genie team uh, for almost, uh, I think, five years now. So it's, it's been it's been some time. Uh, and I'm also AWS. I'm an AWS community hero. So I do a lot of stuff on AWS and speak about AWS, write about AWS and organize a lot of different events. I'm also a DevOps Days global core organizer. So I help DevOps Days events all around the world. Um, so I'm very involved in the uh, organizer side of things as well. Uh, so uh, today, going back to the original topic, we're gonna talk about on call. We are gonna mention some things about uh, alerting and instant response as well. Of course, they are, uh, very, very related. And if you have any questions, you can just ask. And uh, at the end of the presentation, I will be happy to answer if I can. Uh, so uh, normally, if uh, this was in person, I would probably ask you, like, did you have any experience dealing with an incident? And usually, uh, if you are watching this, probably you have had some incidents, and maybe you are struggling with. Uh, uh, with on call, uh, you probably don't like on call. It's very common, of course. You know the reason over is obvious, of course. And um, today we're going to talk about that. And uh, of course, uh, I'm going to give you some actionable insights, hopefully, to make on call much better for your uh, organization. But before uh, talking about some ways to make on call much better, I want to talk about um, why on call matters because. Uh, without understanding this, you can't make on-call better. You need to understand the why first. So even the most reliable services fails all the time. Uh, you know, uh, Werner Vogels also said this today and pretty much in his every keynote. Everything fails all the, all the time. Uh, doesn't matter if, even if it has five nines, six nines, nine nines, whatever nines, right? It doesn't matter. And uh, the example I'm going to give you today is from 911, you know, the service that may, our lives depends on, right? Uh, so it's a different number in Turkey, but usually when you say 911, everyone knows about it, right? So I, my examples are from US. Uh, so in 2014, on a June morning in Washington, uh, 911's IT projects and operations managers was alerted. So a man tried, but only was able to reach out to 911 by borrowing someone else's phone um, and this happened only for one telecom provider but uh, no one responded and the problem is solved only hours later without any response so no one knew what happened and in 2018 just two years ago so emergency cell phone service faced an even more serious incident so this time the data center provider that these you know many telecom providers used to operate their services had an outage um, 
and we see you know aws google microsoft and all the uh, all the uh, service providers fail all the time this is very common so this was and yet another case actually so it brought down the wireless 911 calls for many major cell carriers over a day and this was a major incident so you know all stressful uh, situations you know doesn't have to be uh, distressful of course there may be some minor incidents as well but usually for big companies for uh, important services uh, these incidents matter so much so it's it's costing us a lot of money and sometimes even people's lives in these examples just like in these examples so uh, of course if we were able to solve these problems without any human interaction uh, of course we would have but uh, so we, we don't know what's going to happen beforehand. So we need people on call. We need people who can respond to these incidents in a timely manner. So we need people uh, on call who can solve, uh, who can deal, uh, work on these incidents. And the problem is with on call is uh, most people think on call sucks. And uh, of course, I'm, I'm pretty sure many of us here uh, think about the same because we had some bad experiences. Sometimes it's because you can't go to the beach without your laptop or you get up at 2 a.m. in the morning. Of course, it's not fun. And, you know, the research backs this up. And um, so the researchers from the University of Hamburg work with 132 individuals from 13 organizations. So they collected daily survey over a period of four days, you know, during which they were required to be available during non-working hours and four days during which they were not required to be available. And they also collected, you know, the cortisol level samples, body's main stress hormone from 51 of them. So the results, um, sorry, the results reveal that on call is not leisure time and there are significant effects of extended work availability on the daily start of day mood and cortisol awakening response. So acknowledging this matters so much and it helps us invest more in on-call because you know uh, we should acknowledge that you know on-call time is not leisure time you know there are no alerts but you're still stressed out because you're waiting for some call or because you know you're you're already alerted because something might have ha might might happen any time so acknowledging this helps us ensure uh, helps companies ensure that you know we put enough effort to keep our people healthy you know uh, and Actually, as a software development industry, we had a lot of good steps towards reducing this uh, stress by making you know, small iterations and automating a lot of manual processes using DevOps principles and tooling. So before you know the classic IT problem, you know releases are every three months, six months, whatever. It's very stressful. And lots of things breaks. Uh, now we are in a better shape. And at last, team had a supporting data on this. So our team talk with 100 IT professionals and found out that 57% of teams report fever bugs or outages after adopting CI/CD solutions. So we especially see companies adopting these, you know, solutions pipelines as a, as a must for companies adopting uh, the, the famous microservices. And in the last decade, as big tech companies see many benefits in breaking things into small parts uh, and empowering teams you know the uh, the teams that you know are responsible for many 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 of things. They don't have much dependencies to other teams. So we started investing more in these microservices architectures. And the problem is microservices are not easy. So uh, just you build your CI/CD pipeline, automates uh, lots of things, and that's not enough. So it requires a lot of uh, operational excellence, let's say. So we took the idea of empowering teams one step further. So uh, I mentioned Werner Vogels at the beginning of, present, of my presentation, and here uh, it goes again. The mentality, you know, the you built it, you run it, change our industry. So this mentality matters so much to me. Uh, I think today, you know, DevOps empowers, you know, both developers to do more ops and ops people to do more dev stuff. Uh, so it's, you know, it's not disconnected, totally disconnected anymore. And uh, one example at Atlassian's Opsini team, you know, when we were 15 people in the engineering team back in the days, only two technical co-founders were taking on core responsibilities. And 
once the pager load increased, once we needed to scale our applications and teams on call was much harder. So the solution is, you know, we started putting developers on call and paging them for urgent issues. It's, so, uh, you know, we usually hear about this, you know, developer, we should develop, put developers on call and uh, we don't really talk a lot about the reasoning behind and it's important because you sometimes face with, you know, resistance, but it, I think it's the key, uh, it's one of the key uh, things that you can do to make on-call much better for everyone. So first of all, you know, develop, this, this developers becoming on-call helps companies meet the increasing demand on availability, performance, and security within more complex systems like microservices. You know, developers of these services are often the most qualified people to identify and resolve the problems quickly. Because usually if the problem goes off people, uh, they don't really have any idea about the internals. So it's, it takes some time going back and forth between developers. So it's, it's usually taking a lot of time. But if uh, usually, and usually the problem is because there's a change and developers are usually making that change. So they probably are uh, in a better position to fix these problems faster. And being on call enables you know, developers this is very important, it enables developers to experience the problems and the pain from the first hand and learn from them and implement better systems to minimize the operational problems. So the outcome, of course, is often better testing, documentation, instrumentation, monitoring, and alerting. So if you know uh, your developers uh, have no idea what is happening in the ops side, they don't really have any empathy for them. But once they are, they, they are getting paged, they now have, uh, they now know, uh, you know, that's uh, why that log matters so much. But without that, you know, on-call uh, page, they don't really know uh, why these uh, things that, you know, they don't usually care about matter so much. So it's very important to kind of create this uh, empathy between teams. And the last benefit, usually we forget about this, but management is very important uh, in, you know, in every part of your uh, IT, either it's development or operations. So uh, it also helps, you know, putting developers on call also helps better alignment of development and management. So managers now are able to measure and see how much their developers spend time on the, you know, the sacrifices they make while they try to move fast. So, you know, once they get a lot of dollars, they deal, start dealing with dollars, they don't really have any time to develop new features. Now the managers can see, you know, uh, the effort and give clear reasons to prioritize work related to reliability. They usually see these reliability work as part of operations people's jobs, but, but that doesn't really work uh, to help align a better, you know, DevOps culture. But this definitely, I think, helps. And I've seen it from first hand. So now I will share a personal story with you. So it's uh, it was about 5 p.m. Uh, in Friday evening. So I was a developer back in the days, uh, I think two and a half years ago, uh, this happened. Uh, so we were finally ready to ship the feature. We worked on for two, two weeks and we couldn't wait until Monday. And uh, that was a mistake. I'm not advocating for no ship on Fridays. Uh, uh, of course, you should ship on Fridays. If you're not shipping on Fridays, there's something wrong. But it was 5 p.m., so we could have waited until Monday. But we were really excited because, you know, I was working on this feature about indexing our alerting data to Elasticsearch for almost two weeks, so we really couldn't wait. Uh, so, you know, for those who don't know Obscene, uh, so I was a developer back in the days. Obscene is an on-call and incident response management solution. So. Uh, alerting data, you know, we receive a lot of uh, alerting data from other tools and the alerting page is our main page, so it's really important. So the feature we worked on was about how we index that alerting data to Elasticsearch. So after a lot of testing, we shipped it and everything was fine, really. Uh, but after checking out for product, after checking out production for about uh, 10 minutes, we were finally ready to go uh, until uh, it wasn't right. So. Uh, this is a true story. Uh, so first, our customer success team asked if something is wrong. 
with the alerts page. And uh, we and again, alerts page is a big deal uh, because it's our most of the pages are our main page. So people had some inconsistencies and they were seeing already acknowledged or closed alerts in the UI. So on the backhand side, uh, everything was fine. Alerts were going uh, right and notifications uh, are also were also right. Uh, but on the main page, there were inconsistencies. So they are acknowledging alerts, but they are seeing it's still not acknowledged. So it's a big deal. So the team was able to replicate the issue. So uh, the customer success team, they decided to create an alert for uh, the team responsible for the alerts page. So they use our Slack application. They create an alert for the alerting team, you know, slash genie alert, alert show, uh, alert page show inconsistent state for some alerts. So alert team gets the alerts. Uh, so the on-call engineer from the alerting team got page and starting looking at the problem, he was also able to replicate it. Then after checking out some Jira issues, he saw that you know we just sent the big update to Elasticsearch, uh, so he was aware of the pro uh, issue uh, that we were sending. So the next step was to add me as a responder for the alert, as you know he saw my name. Um, Obscini uh, page me as well. That feeling, you know, and you get an alert after you send an issue uh to production so we started talking on slack uh, and after spending a couple of minutes searching logs and checking out dashboards we decided to create an official incident from that alert and bring the incident response team in because we couldn't figure out why this is happening and we couldn't also roll back at the time so we also uh, added a status page entry for our customers to see the problem there's a problem uh, so creation of the incident paged five team members automatically and within the incident you know obscene had a link to our incident command center so we use this you know to communicate in real time so everyone was there so our our goal is to stop the bleeding first so as uh, we started looking at the code one engineers one of the engineers suggested that this you know administrator option that we had back in the days for emergencies where we could disable access to our uh, clusters if you want to. So we took a risk and disabled one of the clusters we had to back in the days. So after some testing, we realized that it stopped the problem. We suspected that you know there were some inconsistencies, but we couldn't sure we took our chances actually. So uh, it stopped the problem. Uh, but of course there was one cluster left, so uh, we couldn't wait in that state for a long time. So we should figure out why this is happening and uh, bring back uh, our system into a healthy state. So we, um, we uh, also getting alerts we also started after cl disabling cluster we started getting alerts from amazon cloudwatch because there were now uh, more load going through the remaining cluster but that was expected we had some uh, empty states space in that uh instance so it was fine but it was scary <laughs> that was uh so everything was under control uh so we associate the, the alert with the existing incident so you know we have everything in under one incident uh, so at this point, uh, we stopped the bleeding a little bit, a little bit of luck, but we still had inconsistencies and didn't know what was causing the problem. So we debugged our code for hours, and then we found out that a code change created inconsistency because we weren't considering the async nature of writes to Elasticsearch, and we were simply reading from an old version and indexing it to a wrong cluster. So it was a uh, there was something we should have cached, but of course, uh, it's coding, so sometimes uh, there are problems. But you know, it took us one hour to send the fix, and it was uh, about middle uh, of the night at that point. Uh, I think it was about <laughs> 2 a.m. Uh, once we re-indexed and fixed all the inconsistencies. So we did both good things and bad things during the incident. We had some learnings. And, and uh, so now I'm going to talk about some key takeaways, and some of them are not related to this incident, but some of them I'm going to give uh, some examples from this incident, or some uh, yeah, some parts uh, are related to the key takeaways. So uh, now we are going to talk about five main key takeaways. So uh, which are humane schedules, actionable alerts, training, transparency, and analysis and learning. I, these are my five key takeaways for a healthy on-call culture. Uh, but of course, we talked about why on-call is important. That's also important because you know on-call is stressful. Don't forget that. So on-call schedules have a significant impact on the morale and effectiveness of your team. So the key is finding the right balance between the demands of on-call coverage and the needs of the individual team members. So 
uh, the the solution is human schedules. What I mean by that is, first you should inform your team members before uh, at least a month, at least a month before they're on call, so they can, you know, um, arrange their schedules accordingly. And you should allow, you should give some flexibility to your teams to be able to, uh, you know, change uh, shifts if they need to. Of course, you should be monitoring these schedules so no one is taking a lot of uh, the uh, on-call work and burnout. So uh, again, the flexibility part is important. And you know, the, there's this study uh, by the Economic Policy of Incident on Institute. On-call employees with irregular schedules are more than twice as likely to experience work-family conflict than employees with typical schedules. So this says a lot, right? So definitely you know, tell your employees that they're on call at least a month before. I prefer at least two months. So it's important so they can arrange their priorities. Uh, sometimes last minute changes happen because we are human. So you should give some flexibility to your teams as well. And another important thing about schedules is that you should think about, you know, shift sizes. And there's no one size fits of uh, fits all approach when it comes to establishing shift options, but there are, I think, three important points to consider. So shift lengths should leave time for people to deal with any follow-up activities, such as like debugging uh, the cause of an you know alarm or writing a postmortem after an incident. Uh, so and the on-call team should have enough time between shifts to relax and recover. And the last one is whenever possible, you know, you should prioritize scheduling on-call shifts for business hours to reduce alarm fatigue, you know, team fatigue. So this is important. So I know that there, not every team have, you know, not every team has the chance to uh, create follow the sign shifting, you know, the kind of shifting that uh, teams are on call during business hours because you have teams in uh, other parts of the world where you can, you know, schedule cover 24 hours uh, during business hours. Like if you have teams in Europe, US and, Australia, you can do that, but not every team had it, had this, right? So uh, if you can, you know, try to uh, balance this work for different time zones. Um, and the last one is having a supportive team, so collaborative culture, whatever you want to call. It. So um, having a supportive team can make a huge difference in both employee satisfaction and on-call effectiveness. So if someone has a particular active night, like encourage other team members to step up and offer to take the next shift. It's totally fine. If personal emergencies or significant life events come up, they can. So team members need to know that they have support system to take the takes over for them. Uh, so fostering this kind of culture where teams uh, make team members take care of each other uh, can significantly lighten the burden of on-call work. So uh, I'm gonna mention about the on-call book uh, I authored, I wrote. Uh, it's about 100 pages book at the end of my presentation, but this is a checklist from that book. So um, if you are building a schedule, I think you should uh, think about uh, maybe even just, you know, follow this uh, checklist to uh, create a healthy, balanced schedule for your team. So uh, first, like I want to go over them. So first, uh, you should share schedules at least one month prior to on-call, we mentioned that. Rotations should be no longer than two weeks. This is important. Uh, and repeating on-call no longer than two weeks. Daily on-call time should not be longer than uh, 12 hours. And the next consecutive on-call is at least three weeks away. Like you are on-call for a week and you are on-call uh, the week after, and that doesn't work really. You don't really have time to recover. So you should have at least like, uh, let's say five, uh, four or five team members to be able to cover that um, in a health way. And rotations overlap for hand, half an hour for proper on-call handover is important. So backup schedules also indicate who should be on secondary on-call and con contacted in the event of an escalation because you need to know that you are safe. Like if something happens, it gives you a sense of like relief. And team members can request overrides from the teammates for immediate needs. Uh, we talked about this. And prom notifications for schedule or rotation changes is important. Like notify your team if 
rotation is changing so in case like there is something uh going on they know uh who is responsible usually we do this through automation uh, using tools like obscene so you should also record all schedule changes as well because uh, at the end of the day you don't know if something is take like someone is taking all the on-call responsibility and burning out if you don't have any record of it right and if you are also paying for on-calling you should uh, you should have a recording uh, and finally you should discuss schedules with the team at least every month like if something is wrong if something is not working for them you should ask because a lot of people won't just you know come and tell you you should you should ask and uh, avoid that burnout before it happens and the second one is actionable alerts so uh, so towards you know my my takeaway towards a healthy room call uh, actionable alerts because you know actionable alerts as i define them alerts that are uh, there are alerts that are there for reason and you know what i mean is i mean something must have really happened and i know and these alerts tell you how to start investigating the issue and get more help if you need it and these are extremely important during on call because actionable alerts provide context and guidance to reduce mean time to resolve and stress so if you're getting some alerts that you don't know what happened you know what to do how to react to that it's very stressful and I have three things I want to mention as part of actionable alerts. So the first one is automated alerting. You should try to catch inconsistencies before custom impact in an ideal world. So uh, this was our goal, and this usually is the case, but at the example that I gave you earlier, we couldn't do that. So uh, on the other hand, uh, we were good at giving our customer success team a way to alert on call engineers about the issue. And you know this is important because sometimes issues comes from the customer success team and if they don't have access to this kind of tools where you can you know alert engineers especially during urgent issues uh, you lose some time and uh, of course it makes things more stressful for your team uh, and customer success team as well uh, and we will also be able to group alerts under an incident easily. This is also important because if you have a lot of alerts scattered around a tool or other tools, uh, it's also hard to keep track of things and increases stress. And automating alerting with smart checks and rules saves a lot of time and reduces stress of you know being lost within many alerts. So and the second one is to have clear escalation paths. So using a tool like Obscene solves this problem. And on call engineers was, you know, in our case, was automatically alerted. And the team didn't know, didn't need to know uh, who to call for help uh, because it was all already documented and automated. So we had an escalation pad in place. If we weren't able to reach out to on call, we had backup. We were also able to call for help to, you know, automatically after on call. I did me as a responder to the alert that they didn't need to check my phone, whatever, like call me, send me an SMS. It was all automated, so we bring in the incident response team uh, easily as well, thanks to this. Um, and the last one is leveraging one-click actions. So one-click actions on alerts help on call to execute actions, like getting logs from your tools automatically onto the alert, or starting an issue to instance, whatever, or anything you can automate. Uh, sometimes some things say you should uh, do this uh, from the tool, but sometimes these are simple like checks so you can you should automate whatever you can in these cases because you don't need you don't want to switch between tools during these stressful times and having you know these uh fast actions definitely uh common triage and remediation actions makes it easy and fast uh so there is also you know a lot of value in having run books that show on call how to start investigating the issue with step-by-step -step instructions uh usually the problem is they get old and if no one takes care of these run books uh, sometimes they are useless so you should uh, review them um, time to time and you know spend some time on them as well because these are the essentially documentations they can get old and people might forget about updating them especially if you're on call if you see something wrong on a uh, run book you should definitely pay attention and spend some time on that and these are special rounds definitely helps reduce stress because you don't need to go to another person to be able to take action if you don't know uh, what is happening and that happens a lot. 
So the, the, the third uh, key takeaway from my uh, presentation is on the importance of training because as we train our on-call teams, as they practice more, they will gain confidence. So, uh, and it is important to update on-call schedules and bring more people after engineers uh, get some experience. So this ensures that we distribute the on-call lot and don't put too much pressure on the same people for a long time. So at Opsgini, again, an example from Atlas and Opsgini, once engineers get some experience, we organize sessions and explain on-call basics and you know teach them some uh, or diagnostic tools. We also use and recommend techniques like shadowing, which I recommend to everyone. So what is it? So we put ex an experienced on-call engineer together with a junior one at the same time. So they get the alerts at the same time. They work on them at the same time. Basically, basically send hands-on training. Um, so this makes transition as much smoother and less stressful uh, for inexperienced on-call engineers. Definitely recommend it and can be automated as well with uh, tools. And the other one, uh, so uh, Gremlin also is organizing this session. So the game days uh, are also an important part of this. Uh, you know, the chaos engineering that you must have heard about. Uh, and the Raymond keynote today, uh, Lego uh, was talking about how um, they use serverless services to, you know, uh, innovate faster and create more resilient services. Uh, and they said the next step for them is chaos engineering because they uh, innovate fast and they know that things can break fast as well. And the best way to uh, be able to find out about problems early in the process is to uh, actually uh, simulate uh, the problem on production. So uh, in this case, you, you don't have to start from production, but uh, my recommendation is you can organize training sessions. Uh, you know, usually we call them game days in in, in our industry. You know, you, you have a real life like scenario of instant response. So one thing, you know, uh, and you go over them with your team and try to solve the problem and have some pizza at the same time. Maybe have fun. Uh, it's also a great group activity. So um, uh, so one thing in my example from my uncle story earlier was to define the roles and command instant response in a structured way. So we had some experienced engineers, they were able to command it, but we had some problems. So uh, the best way is if you have a game day, you can practice this be uh, before the incident, so you, you know what to do during the incident. Game days can definitely help with you know, uh, putting more structure into your instant response. And on makes, uh, of course, this makes on-call much uh, less stressful. Uh, so uh, you can have proper roles uh, if you get prepared, like incident commander, subject matter expert, scribe. So ensure you can ensure everyone knows what they're supposed to do in such stressful situations. And you can also autom automate these distribution of roles using tools like Opsini. So the third item uh, in my list is transparency. This is usually overlooked. I think it's ma it matters so much. So transparency, you don't, you shouldn't think about this just, you know, transparency to your clients. Transparency matters for all your stakeholders, and it's critical in many aspects of your business, any business. And I think in our case, essentially, uh, it's a must in our case, and it makes on call much, 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 much more me. So. Uh, to put our lessons, you know, open company or bullshit value in practice, we do many things. And we uh, opened our internal ops handbook. And as a lessons opportunity, we also have internal documents for our on-call teams. Within these documents, we start, we state our expectations around important policies like the responsibilities of on-call, how to switch shifts temporarily, and even the flexibility of working from home after dealing with incidents at night. So. Usually, like people get up at 2 a.m. in the morning. If they don't really have this written and people don't follow these uh, practices, they feel the obligation to come to work during the in the morning. And if you know this is written and everyone uh, follows these uh, recommendations, uh, people you know can take their time to recover. 
so nowadays we see, you know, and the thing is specifying these policies help people know what they are expected and what they're not expected. This is very important. Nowadays we see many companies following uh, similar approaches to transparency and some companies even did uh, more than sharing their internal docs. They broadcast their instant response. They, so you know, there are a lot of things that you can do to keep uh, things transparent. And again, I, need, I want to mention uh, transparency first starts within your uh, team uh, and you know, uh, share your policies internally, uh, publicly and make them written. This is important. Uh, so when it comes to transparency, stakeholder communication is very important. These incidents are affecting our users that you know rely on our operations. They need to know what is happening so they can take their own actions when necessary. In our case, we were fast to enter our first status page entry, but we could have sent more frequent updates on what happened during the incident, especially with the internal customer success team. So the new, you know, our uh, we have this in, internal service status pages for Obscene, and they are definitely helpful for our internal stakeholders like our customer success team to have visibility in Opsgini so you know, they can see what is happening and be up to date. Uh, and of course, you should uh, follow the same for our, your external customers and even since share uh, some metrics to build trust between uh, your customers and you know, your company. So uh, the final one in my list, definitely not the least important one. Uh, of course, uh, the reason we take these incidents and on call so seriously is because they are great learning opportunities. So you should analyze and continue to learn from these incidents, and we can only get better if we analyze them and you know continue to learn from them. That's the only way. So um, so this is why we should record every detail about on call changes and it's in response process and so in our case obstini has every log and detail on what happened including configuration changes and real-time communication logs of instant response we can use this data to improve on call by you know examining things like on the left of my presentation things like on call response responsiveness of uh, on alerts on call times for engineers uh, Teams' performances and even you know the health of our uh, services, uh, or things like uh, on-call duration for uh, each rotation, number of notifications. This can help you a lot uh, to make on-call uh, much uh, healthier. So first, collect some data. You can just you know um, estimate uh, these things. So then we should be writing our postmortems as soon as possible after the incident. Uh, because you know, once uh, the, you know, some time passes, you people tend to forget about things. So you should write postmortems uh, to describe what happened and how we can avoid having similar problems in the future. And the reason we do these postmortems is because you know, uh, I like this. Uh, and from Andrew Clay Sheffer, my friend, I says you are building. You are either building a learning organization or you will be losing to someone who is. So postmortems or post incident reviews, whatever you want to call them, uh, definitely plays an important role into building uh, such learning culture. Uh, so, so one important key in these documents is in these uh, postmortems is uh, that I want to mention is uh, to be blameless. And you know, what I mean by blameless is that you should not name people who are you know, supposedly caused the incident. Uh, during stressful situations, it is people's, you know, often the first reaction to blame people. Uh, but apart from the fact that, you know, incidents cannot be avoided in complex systems, and probably uh, the person or the team didn't have enough time to automate it, those things, it is never people's fault. So naming people creates a lot of problems. Uh, definitely not, doesn't help with anything at all. Uh, so people will fear from doing mistakes. They stop taking risky jobs and when you look at this uh, from my experience I can tell you the people who make uh, bigger mistakes they take uh, more riskier jobs they take more responsibility so or worse like they uh, if you blame them they stop telling the truth and they make their mistake and things can get much worse so we should focus on bringing out uh, you know uh, how we can improve and not look for a scapegoat. Uh, 
figure we should figure out how we can improve and not look for a big scapegoat this is extremely important and one last thing that i want to mention i didn't have a separate takeaway slide for this i wanted to include it in this because strictly related to the reporting because if you don't have reporting you don't know how to compensate but uh, this is a little bit different than the other items, but I still want to talk about this because I think it's key in making one call healthier. So uh, as we talked in the beginning of my presentation, uh, you know, it is backed by research that on call is not leisure time, even if there is no alert. So some companies give a day off or some companies pay for on call in different ways. So the critical part is that if you expect your engineer to put extra effort as sort of their uh, business hours, your business hours, and take on call duties, uh, you should think about you know, compensating these efforts. And in some countries, this is a must and you know, covered by the law. We must pay for on call. In some countries, you don't. Uh, so it's tricky like, uh, it's tricky uh, to figure out uh, how you want to pay, but my recommendation, if even if you aren't paying actual money, you should, for example, this is a practice that we uh, we had before. Uh, so I think we still had this. Uh, if you, if someone is uh, on call a week for a week, uh, also of business hours, we give you a day off uh, for the next uh, two weeks. You can take a, a day off uh, whenever uh, they want uh, the following two weeks. So this helps them recover and you show them their own call matters, but you also acknowledge that you know uh, their uh, efforts matter uh, for you. It doesn't mean you know you should also have flexibility, a lot of flexibility that we mentioned all that, but this is also uh, should be considered compensation matters. So we talk about uh, first, how DevOps uh, changed on call, you know, I made it better and how, uh, you know, the uh, putting developers on call uh, can make a difference. Then we talked about remain schedules, you know, uh, thinking about on call uh, scheduling, telling your employees before uh, and giving some flexibility to your teams. And then we talked about actionable alerts, uh, how uh, having alerts that says something uh, helps reduce stress. And uh, we talked about constructing proper escalation paths and leveraging some automation to make alerting much better. And we talked about training, onboarding new people using shadowing, you know, uh, two people at the same time, get some experience. Then we talked about game days, uh, you know, the chaos engineering uh, gremlin folks uh, to train your employees. Uh, about on call. Then we talked about transparency, so you should be clear on your expectations, you should write them down and send status updates to your stakeholders, both internal and external. And finally, we talked about analysis and learning just now, so you should collect data and write blameless postmortems and compensate for on call. So we, uh, I spend a lot of time uh, thinking and writing and organizing things around on call and uh, this is a book I wrote I think six months ago uh, it's still very up to date uh, it's about 100 pages uh, everything I know I learned about on call in this book is in this book so it's free to download I think you need to give your email address uh, if you want you can also download this uh, it's in, uh, it's, it has a lot of uh, details uh, about the things that also I mentioned in this presentation and more. Uh, so as you know, I told you before, uh, on call by definition is stressful and can lead to stress and burnout for your people. And applying these five principles, five practices, uh, will drive good results in making on call happier and healthier for your organization. And uh, the key is we should put our people first and remember that the less stressful on call is, the healthier your teams are. So, you know, they can focus on what really matters and they can enjoy work and bring the best out of themselves every day. So this is it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, All right. Think, All right. Great. Yeah, we can take some questions. Yes, yes, we have, uh, gosh, about 10 minutes uh, for questions. So 
plenty of time, guys. If you have a question for Sirhat, please go ahead and use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions. We'll get to as many as we can. Here is the first one. Let's see, what is the first thing you would automate if there isn't any on-call practice in place? All right, this is a good question. So uh, if you don't really have anything, if you don't have automation, I would uh, start considering building your schedule first. Uh, and my recommendation is whatever tool you use, you should automate this. You don't use an Excel sheet, whatever, because if there is a change, it's really hard to track. Uh, and uh, if you are putting people on call, you should do some things before putting them on call. And we mentioned about you know many of many things uh, in my talk. And I think the first thing is building your schedule properly. Talk with your teams. This is important. That like from the uh, if you have a big organization, uh, for example, CTO or VP of engineering, they don't know uh, everyone's personal situation or every team's internal details. Uh, but they can state some assumptions and say that, let's say, as we mentioned in the checklist, uh, every like you can't have, you can't be on call for over a week, and they can make some assumptions and restrictions on the schedules. Um, but the first thing I think you should do is uh, to build your on-call schedules. All right. Great. Next question. Uh, and this is this is a good one. I like this one. Any recommendations for managing incidents in an open source project where we can't really mandate a person as on call? <laughs> All right. So <laughs> I don't have any experience in this. So I, I wrote some SDKs for uh, open source SDKs just for fun for uh, our company, but. Um, it, it's an SDK, so we don't really have an on-call for that. Um, but if you are, have an on-call project and it's running on production and it's serving customers, or well, I mean, that means either you are earning some money, so someone probably is responsible for that. So um, then you should probably uh, have at least some backup uh so you can distribute your lot that's the only way i can think of because there's no way someone is on call uh all the time i mean i know some people <laughs> do that but this is very rare uh they right. usually burn out uh, but if you let's say if you have an open source project and uh, so the usually uh good thing is if you have a pipeline that can tell you if uh, build is broken. Usually that's the way that you know something is wrong. Uh, I think you can automate and uh, alert uh, people who are responsible for that commit or change. That's the way that I can, uh, I think, uh, the best way, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, again, I don't really have any experience with open projects on call open, in open projects, or open source okay. projects. So. Yeah. All right. Well, that's that's okay. Uh, next question: uh, Do you think a primary and secondary on-call support is a good idea? So, uh, primary and secondary, uh, we I think it's a it's a best practice uh, to have two people on call at the same time. We do that for every on-call schedule in Obscene. Uh So, usually senior people are on call uh, in the secondary uh, rotation because if especially if the uh, the first uh, people the primary on call is uh, primary on call doesn't know how to deal with the incident they usually you know she usually calls for help and the easiest way is to escalate the incident to the secondary on call person and uh, our practice is to put uh, senior people in the secondary um, on call. The, the, the key is if there are a lot of alerts going to secondary on call, you should monitor that and take some actions. Either so that maybe the primary on call is not ready to take on call, uh, or uh, there are a lot of incidents and uh, you should fix some you know more fundamental problems but I, it's a, a good practice is one of the best practices uh, that you can employ like you should have primary and secondary on call 
and we do that at Obscene as well. All right, great. Um, just a quick reminder, guys, uh, we have about six minutes left uh, for the question and answer period. So if you do have a question, go ahead and use your GoToWebinar control panel. Next question, is there a tool that can be used for building the schedule? There are team members who do not look at a schedule when it's published and bring in last minute changes often. How can that be yeah. dealt with? So I guess two questions for you. Yep, that's a great question. And uh, my answer is actually obvious because I work for Obscene. Uh, this is one of the features uh, that we have, like you can uh, share schedules with your teams, they have visibility. And when there is a change, you can uh, send a notification to your team members automatically, uh, send a message to Slack. And there are other tools other than Obscene as well, but I would recommend Obscene, of course. Uh, so these tools, uh, automating on call schedules and escalations, uh, it's usually part of the deal. Like if there is a change to schedules, uh, you let your other team members know about this. And it's also one of the best practices. We usually use Slack uh, as a backup channel, but our first uh, way is to send uh, notifications. So notifications are people choose their own uh, let's say notification channel, they can either take SMS messages or use their mobile apps or basically, or take calls, uh, whatever they want, mm -hmm. and they get notified uh, about this, these changes. Uh, and I agree that these changes matter so much, so you should definitely uh, notify your team members. Okay, great. Next question, uh, any recommendation any recommendations for preferred ways to analyze an incident after it is concluded? Mm -hmm. So uh, I can mention our approach. So, uh, so the first thing is, uh, as I mentioned in my talk, you shouldn't wait uh, for a long time before writing your postmortem because you tend to forget about things. And the other one is uh, you should uh, have some data uh, like. Uh, and using automation for on call uh, definitely helps. Like you know when this incident started and when you acknowledge this, when you uh, resolve the issue, and uh, if you have alerts from different tools, you know, uh, and if you have some automation, you know which services are affected and uh, which alerts are triggered. These are definitely good indicators that can help you. Uh, write more detailed postmortems, um, and so our approach is uh, we uh, let's say we found out about a problem. We run some queries. We use uh, I'm not sure if we are using we are still using that, but back in this we were using Nivrelic. And if you are using an APM solution, whatever you want, uh, you can create some automation, or you can just paste uh, those let's say data, important data about the incident. Uh, back, in the, back in the alert, uh, that can help you have everything you need in one place. So we have some postmortem feature in Obscene as well, so you can just select the incident and uh, create an postmortem using a template and add some description, title, uh, add some priority, add some uh, uh, action items. Uh, but you, you don't have to use a tool like Obscene for this. You can just will the uh, Google Doc, whatever, but it definitely helps to have some structure, like title, description, whatever. Uh, I think this answers okay. the question. All right, great. We have time for one or two more questions here. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, here's a good one. Uh, should we pay extra money for on-call and how, how do we decide how much, if so? Right. So uh, I'm not sure if um, yeah. So I don't know all the details, but I know that so Atlassian is a multinational company. So uh, there are different on-call teams in different parts of the world. We have teams in India, Turkey, uh, Australia, US, and uh, um, uh, Amsterdam, or you know other parts of the world as well. So uh, usually uh, countries decide their own policies. There might be some changes uh, between uh, countries because either because of the legal or uh, 
maybe that team has some say differences in uh, work contracts whatever yeah. so there may be some differences uh, but if you want to pay and i know that a lot of companies in europe is paying for on call but usually in us they don't pay for on call uh, but i know some exceptions as well uh, so you should definitely not pay for on call based on uh, alerts or or you may see more alerts so uh, <laughs> uh, so Talk about maybe the system <laughs> yes <laughs> you make some extra cash uh, break things because it's chaos engineering <laughs> so uh, that's tricky so um, what you can do uh, is you can you know so i by the way i i don't really remember every detail but i uh, think i thought about this in detail uh, i had some research and wrote about this in on call book so there are some details but uh, you can uh, let's say so the one of the good ways is if you have a week of on call you pay a certain amount of cash no matter if there is no incident you still pay so this i think a good approach so you pay for on call and ex uh, some extra cash uh so i think that's a good way it's, it doesn't have any relation to any release uh, it doesn't it's not related to incidents uh mm -hmm. so i think that's a good way uh again i mean in turkey we do extra day off uh that's fine as well in australia i know they pay from call uh but because there are changes between countries uh but even thinking about compensating on call is good yeah okay all right, great. Well, we are about four minutes to the top of the hour. So unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for the question and answer period. I do want to thank everybody who did submit questions. And if we didn't get to your question, I apologize. But please know that uh, that Sirhat and his group will be getting a copy of all of the questions that came through. And I'm sure somebody will be more than happy to follow up with you offline to get your question answered. Uh, also, a quick reminder to the audience that today's event has been re has been recorded so if you missed any or all of the event or if you just want to watch it again you'll have the opportunity to do so following the webinar today we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand and the webinar is also going to be living on the devops.com website which is devops.com slash webinars look in the on demand section and it should be right there waiting for you all right, at the top of the hour, I did mention that we'd be doing a drawing for four dollars Amazon gift cards. So let us go ahead and do that now. Our first winner today is Eugene C. Congratulations, Eugene. Second winner today is Jared F. Congratulations, Jared. Our third winner today is Vince P. Congratulations, Vince. And final winner today is Julie H. Congratulations, Julie. Uh, we'll be following up with all of you offline and uh, get your, uh, uh, your gift card over to you. Uh, if, you see, if you don't see anything in your inbox from us, please check your spam folder. Um, all right, uh, that is about it, Sirhat. Thank you so much for such a great presentation today. Lots of great uh, information, and uh, I, you know, judging from the amount of uh, questions that came in from the audience, I know they got a lot out of it. Also, so thank you again. I really do appreciate it, and also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I am signing off. Have a great day, everybody, and please stay safe. Have a great day. Thank you.